This is American History TV's Lectures in History podcast. This week, University of Utah political science professor David Bueller teaches a class about presidential debates and their influence on voters. Okay, we're going to start today by talking about candidate debates. And that is like my favorite thing about a campaign, whether I was on a campaign staff or a candidate. So I'm really excited to talk about this today. All right, well, I'm going to give you a little bit of history here. Um, so presidential and vice presidential de- general election debates have become really a highlight of the campaign season. It's something we just expect to happen. That has not always been the case. Uh, it's also common in other races, particularly high profile races. So when was the first presidential debate? Here's a trivia question, historical trivia. Anyone know? Give you a hint. No one recognizes those people? (laughs) All right, that's a false hint. That's Lincoln and Douglas. A lot of times people think, is here the famous Lincoln-Douglas debates, and and they ran against each other for president in 1860. Actually, their debates were when they were both running for the U.S. Senate in Illinois in 1858 and had numerous debates around the state of Illinois. And so kind of an odd situation, right? That they ran against each other for US Senate. Douglas was elected by the legislature at that time. The legislatures appointed them, the senators. And then two years later, they're on the major party tickets against each other. But their debates in 1858 were published and circulated a lot in 1816. The issues had not really changed a whole lot. Okay, so the real first presidential debate was between John Kennedy and Richard Nixon in 1960. Now, at this point, Richard Nixon had been vice president for eight years, much better known than Kennedy, who was a fairly junior U.S. senator. Though his family was somewhat well-known, and, you know, he wasn't totally unknown, but he was not as well-known. Nixon had made a lot of his political career, had taken advantage of television in his career, believe it or not, and was also uh, known as a very effective and fierce debater. So the television networks decided, you know, television was now kind of mainstream, everyone had one, and they decided to sponsor a series of debates. I think Nixon was very confident and more than willing, even though he was the front runner, to engage in these debates because he knew so much more and was such a good debater, he could totally put Kennedy in his place. Uh, The consensus was these debates helped cost Nixon the election, which was a very close election. It, first of all, elevated Kennedy immediately because now they're on an even level, the senator and the vice president. Uh, Also, his appearance was much better, much more handsome, better, more telegenic. And uh, there have been some studies on this at the time or some polls The people who listened to the debate, we're talking especially the first debate, there were like four debates, and they were really boring back then. They had really long answers, and they're like two hours long. They're more interesting now, I think. But those who listened to the first debate on radio thought Nixon won. Those who watched it on TV felt Kennedy won. So the appearances were really important. So after that, there were no more presidential debates for a while. Part of it was uh, something called the Fairness Doctrine that says that if a station licensed by the Federal Communications Commission gives a candidate time on the air, they have to give their opponent equal time. And so in 1964, uh, Lyndon Johnson was not anxious to debate. He had a huge lead. He didn't really want to debate Barry Goldwater. And they could rely on this Fairness Doctrine to say, there's no way to do it because there's like 10 people running for president, right? You've got all the really minor party candidates and so forth, and it's just not practical. And so he was able to dodge it successfully. In 1968, when Nixon was running again, from his experience in 1960, he was not too anxious to debate now. He'd kind of learned his lesson. So and in 68 and 72, Nixon was uh, on the top of the ticket for the Republicans. And so this kind of stopped presidential debates. 
it looked like maybe 1960 was a one-off, that it was never going to happen again. But in 1976, uh, Jerry Ford, Gerald Ford was the president who took over for Nixon when he resigned. He was trailing his opponent by as much as 30 points that summer. And uh, they found a way around the Fairness Doctrine, which was as if a third party, I think in 76 it was the League of Women Voters, later became the Commission on Presidential Debates. But if a third party held an event and the networks decided to cover it, it wasn't the networks giving the candidates a forum, they were just covering a news event. See how lawyers work, right? They find a way around it that we could do these debates with the people we want, the major party candidates without having 20 people on the, on the stage. And so uh, being behind, Ford was like more than willing to take the chance and to uh, debate. And so since 1976, we've had presidential and vice presidential debates every, every election season. Um, usually three presidential and one vice president presidential debate. In 1992, uh, town hall format was instituted for one of the debates and that has kind of stuck. Used to be questions by a panel of reporters. There'd be like four reporters asking questions. Uh, more recently, they've gone to a single moderator asking questions. And I think and, and encouraging a lot more interaction between the candidates uh, up through the Oh, I would say at least the 1980s, maybe even to the 1990s. Answers from candidates were pretty much well prepared and pretty much stock answers and not a lot of interaction. Where well, there have been some, uh, some times when there, there was quite a bit of interaction between the candidates that kind of made news. Um, now, most of the time, by the time of the debates, most voters have made up their mind. I mean, I don't know, what are, what's the polling now? on Trump versus Biden. How many undecided are there? Anyone know? Someone's going to hurry and look it up. Greg didn't look it up. I would guess like five or six percent say they're undecided. Now, it may be more than that because there may be people who say one way or the other, but they're a little squishy. They could sort of go either way. Do you have a number? Eleven percent. Really? Wow. I'm surprised. Okay. So, but anyway, so you've got 89 percent and made up their mind, but you've got some voters up for grabs. So television tends to magnify uh, the performance and the personality of the candidates. One observer gave this advice. He said, be liked, be liked. The emotional content of the debate will remain in the viewer's memories for, uh, for longer than the debates, than the ideas being expressed. So how the candidate comes across is going to make much more of an impression than the words they said, typically. There's always, you know, exceptions. But, uh, TV coverage magnifies mistakes or triumphs. When a mistake is made, what happens on the news? Is it one and done? It's replayed constantly, constantly. And now 24 hour news, it's constantly replayed. And the comments of the com commentators were talking about, well, who did well, who, who won, who lost, who, who had a big, you know, a good night, a bad night, whatever. They actually can uh, change public opinion. So polling research shows that after mistakes have been replayed, the public perception of the debates as to who won or lost can actually change. Here's a few examples. After the first 1984 Reagan Mondale debate, a slight majority of viewers thought Reagan had won, about 3% thought he won. An hour after negative reviews, the lead switched to Mondale by one point. Two days later, polls showed that voters thought Mondale had won the debate by a margin of 49%. So it went from Reagan winning to pretty even to within a couple of days, Mondale winning hugely. And the, uh, the challenge for Reagan in that first debate, he was at that time the oldest candidate. We're not breaking those records this year, but uh, he seemed a little confused and muddled and like maybe he's getting too old for the job. He was the incumbent president running for reelection, but his age kind of became an issue. Um, another famous gaffe 
was in 1976 in one of these first, uh, you know, the, the re, uh, redo of debates in 1976 between Ford and Carter. Now this was long before the fall of the Iron Curtain, if you remember that phrase from the Cold War. It's when the Soviet Union basically had puppet states in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union controlled Eastern Europe. And uh, Ford misspoke. He meant to say the people of Eastern Europe do not feel like they are dominated. You know, they don't accept Soviet domination in their hearts, but clearly they were dominated. But anyway, he misspoke and he declared that Eastern Europe was not under Soviet domination. Uh, at that point, Ford had pulled up from 30 points behind to being even or maybe slightly ahead in the race. He stubbornly refused to correct this mistake for several days. And uh, so right after the debate, polls showed that Ford won the debate by about 1%. After news reports of the debate carried on for several days, 62% said Carter had won the debate. So it was this mistake getting magnified and, and he didn't help himself. He would have gone right out that evening and said, that's what I said, but what I meant was this. He probably could have eliminated a lot of that damage to himself. Okay, so we're gonna show a couple of uh, clips. This first one is uh, kind of a little recap on presidential debates the CNN did before the 2012. Okay, just make sure that doesn't feed back to. One indisputable truth that can, the the can make history. I've been there. September 26, 1960, the first televised presidential debate, signaling a new era where appearances matter more than ever and gaffes, however small, are magnified. The goals are the same for all Americans. John F. Kennedy, a young senator from Massachusetts, facing off against Vice President Richard Nixon, who's known to be a fierce debater. But on screen, Kennedy looks cool and calm, while Nixon looks uncomfortable, sweating profusely under the hot studio lights. I think I better shave. Nixon flounders under the glare of television for all four debates. Kennedy goes on to win the election. In 1976, President Gerald Ford makes this blunder in his debate with Georgia Governor Jimmy Carter. There is no Soviet domination of Eastern Europe, and there never will be under a Ford administration. I'm sorry, I want to the just remark becomes a central theme in Carter's campaign. and is blamed by many for costing Ford the election. In 1980, Ronald Reagan was repeatedly attacked by President Carter for his stance on health care. Governor Reagan as a matter of fact, began his political career campaigning around this nation against Medicare. But Reagan wins fans and the election by staying cool. And you go again. Four years later, President Reagan again uses humor to handle attacks on his age during his debate with Walter Mondale. And I want you to know that also, I will not make age an issue of this campaign. I am not going to exploit for political purposes my opponent's youth and inexperience. In the next election, Democratic candidate Michael Dukakis has asked this controversial question in his debate with Vice President George Bush. Governor, if Kitty Dukakis were raped and murdered, would you favor an irrevocable death penalty for the killer? No, I don't, Bernard, and I think you know that I've opposed the death penalty during all of my life. The public sees his answer as cold and dispassionate, and that very night his poll numbers drop. During the 1988 vice presidential debate, Republican Senator Dan Quayle's comparison of John F. Kennedy elicits this blistering response from his opponent. Senator, you're no Jack Kennedy. Body language plays a part in the presidential debate in 1992. George H.W. Bush deliberately looks at his watch and pays for it when the audience and voters see it as disrespectful. Here's differences. Body language makes a difference in the debate between Al Gore and George W. Bush as well. Gore sighs over and over again. And Bush, the underdog, surprises by winning the debate and, of course, the election. That's what a governor. Both President Obama and Governor Romney are seasoned debaters. And experts say neither are prone to making major gaps. But if there is one thing that history has taught us again. when it comes to presidential debates, expect the unexpected. All right. Well... Uh, oh, leave it there. We've got one more. Oh, except I'm not. 
It's not advancing now. There we go. I thought we had to show a little bit from 2016, right? Just to remind us how we got to where we are in this election today. So this is uh, just a little clip from one of their debates. We'll let it go maybe five minutes. I won't. Franklin, I want to clear up your position on this issue because in a speech you gave to a Brazilian bank for which you were paid $225,000, we've learned from the WikiLeaks that you said this, and I want to quote, my dream is a hemispheric common market with open trade and open borders. So that's Thank the you. question. <laughs> that's the question. Please quiet, everybody. Is that your dream, open borders? Well, if you went on to read the rest of the sentence, I was talking about uh, energy. You know, we trade more energy with our neighbors than we trade with the rest of the world combined. And I do want us to have a an electric grid, an energy system that crosses borders, I think that would be a great benefit to us. But you are uh, very clearly uh, quoting from WikiLeaks, and what's really important about WikiLeaks is that the Russian government has engaged in espionage against Americans. They have hacked American uh, websites, American accounts of private people, of institutions, then they have given that information to WikiLeaks for the purpose of putting it on the internet. This has come from the highest levels of the Russian government, clearly from Putin himself, in an effort, as 17 of our intelligence agencies have confirmed, to influence our election. So I actually think the most important question of this evening, Chris, is finally, will Donald Trump admit and condemn that the Russians are doing this, and make it clear that he will not have the help of Putin in this election, that he rejects Russian espionage against Americans, which he uh, actually encouraged in the past. Those are the questions we need answered. We've never had anything like this happen well, in any of our elections before. That was a great pivot off the fact that you want open borders, okay? How did we get on to Putin? Hold, hold on, hold on. No, no, hold that, on. Wait, wait, hold on, folks. Because we could, this is going to end up getting out of control. Let's try to keep it quiet. So for the candidates and for the American people. Go so ahead. just to finish on the borders. Yeah. She wants open borders. People are going to pour into our country. People are going to come in from Syria. She wants 550 percent more people than Barack Obama. And he has thousands and thousands of people. They have no idea where they come from. And you see, we are going to stop radical Islamic terrorism in this country. She won't even mention the words and neither will President Obama. So I just want to tell you, she wants open borders. Now we can talk about Putin. I don't know Putin. He said nice things about me. If we got along well, that would be good. If Russia and the United States got along well and went after ISIS, that would be good. He has no respect for her. He has no respect for our president. And I'll tell you what, we're in very serious trouble because we have a country with tremendous numbers of nuclear warheads, 1,800, by the way, where they expanded and we didn't, 1,800 nuclear warheads, and she's playing chicken. Look, Putin, well, wait, from but, everything I see, has no respect for this person. Well, that's because he'd rather have a puppet as president of no the United puppet, States. No puppet, no puppet. It's pretty clear. It's pretty clear. You won't admit no, that the, the Russians have engaged in cyber attacks against the United States of America. That you encourage espionage against our people. That you are willing to spout the Putin line, sign up for his wish list, break up NATO, do whatever he wants to do, and that you continue to get help from him because. He has a very clear favorite in this race. So I think that this is such an unprecedented uh, situation. We've never had a foreign government trying to interfere in our election. We have 17, 17 intelligence agencies, civilian and military, who have all concluded that these espionage attacks, these cyber attacks, come from the highest levels of the Kremlin, 
and they are designed to influence our elections. I find that deeply disturbing. Yeah, and Let's, I think it's she time. She has no idea whether it's Russia, China, it, or anybody else. I am not quoting she has myself. No idea. I am quoting Hillary, you 17, have no idea. 17 intelligence. Do you doubt 17 our, our military and civilian no idea. agencies? Well, yeah, we'd rather it. believe Vladimir Putin than the military and civilian intelligence professionals who are sworn to protect us. I find that just so, absolutely... She doesn't right. like Mr. Putin because Putin Mr. has outsmarted her at every Mr. step Trump, of the way. I, I, Excuse I, me. Mr. Putin has Mr. outsmarted Mr. her in Mr. Syria. Trump, He's outsmarted her every here. I do step get to, of the way. I do get to ask some questions. Yes, sir. And I would like to ask you this direct question. The top national security officials of this country do believe that Russia has been behind these hacks. Even if you don't know for sure whether they are, do you condemn any interference by Russia in the American election? By Russia or anybody else. You condemn their interference? Of course I condemn. Of course I can. I don't know Putin. I have I'm no asking, idea. I'm asking I never met Putin. <laughs> this is not my... I think we have a good flavor of it there. Uh, yeah. So anyway, in 2016 debates, very spirited. I don't think there was any breakout moment that really changed the race one way or the other. It's interesting to watch this, I think, four years later, with all the more information that's come out about that election. But anyway, anyone want to make a comment on this? I promised Isaac, hopefully you're online, Isaac, that I would show you clips, so hopefully you're happy I did. Okay, and the rest of you too. All right, now let's see if I can make this move again. Seems like the video. All right, so let's see, can you take care of that one, Seth? out of our way. All right, so at these uh, big debates, the presidential, vice presidential debates, one of the traditions is that they have a spin room. And this is where, uh, you see how crowded it is. This is during one of the primary debates. You see Amy Klobuchar there, but where each campaign will have usually surrogates or sometimes a candidate, like in this case, lined up to talk to the uh, media and to put their spin, their take on what just happened. Um, is there any way to move that box, uh, Seth? Do I need to do something? I'll just admit them. Okay. Um, so in a way, this has become, I think, sort of a joke because it's like, I mean, it's, it's sort of, and inevitable, but whatever bad things happens, the campaign will try to put the best face on it versus if it's a good debate, of course, they'll, they'll tout that. Okay. So that reminds me when Klobuchar couldn't name the president of Mexico. Oh, I didn't remember that. Uh, it's um, similar in one of the other debates. Okay, how come I'm not advancing now? Man, that's weird. I'm going to just do this. That's weird. All right, let's just see what's going on here. We don't want to end the show. Okay, here we go. All right, so uh, a well-prepared candidate uses the debate to present their arguments, to deflect attacks, perhaps to land a blow on his or her opponent. Uh, one uh, observer of this, I thought this was a great quote, like soldiers armed with hand grenades, candidates march into televised debates bearing an arsenal of rhetorical ammunition. Whatever the question being asked, debaters are instructed to answer with a desired predetermined response. The goal of staying on message, borrowed from the world of advertising, ties debaters to a set of narrowly conceived themes that have been audience tested and painstakingly followed. So this is from a book I read a while ago called uh, 40 Years of High Risk TV, talking about presidential debates. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit about debate strategy. The first strategy the campaigns deal with is whether or not to debate, or how much to debate. How a campaign approaches the question of debates 
depends on where they are positioned. If they're holding a strong lead or an incumbent, it's different than if an underdog or a challenger. So if you're in the lead, your main objective is avoid mistakes, right? Everything's going well, you just don't wanna mess it up. So avoid mistakes. If you're the underdog, you then will take more risks because what do you have to lose? You're already losing, right? If you can maybe mix things up, get your opponent to make a mistake, you know, that's what you want to do. So I saw this up close and personal. Uh, uh, yeah, I've got so many different stories. I'm gonna use this one though. In 2007, when I was running for mayor of Salt Lake City, after we got through the primary with several candidates, it was me versus Ralph Becker. And our first debate was actually at the Hinckley Institute of Politics back in the old days in Osh, not here in this beautiful new building. And I knew that Ralph was quite a bit ahead of me and that I had uh, about two months till the election. And uh, Ralph and I had always gotten along well. We knew each other. We both served in the legislature together and, and uh, he was there long after I was, but we, we always got along fine. And so I went into this debate fairly aggressive on making attacks on him. And that continued in a couple, you know, every debate. And I remember at one of them, and even that very first one, I went back and read one of the, new, the uh, Utah Chronicle article on it. Ralph was kind of like, what happened to Dave? I thought you were a nice guy. I thought we got along well. I thought we were friends. And at one point I said to Ralph, you know, kind of backstage, I said, Ralph, I have to do something. You're way ahead. I have to do something. I can't just lay down and die. You know, I've got to take the fight to you. But I remember Ralph being kind of shocked that his friend was being so aggressive. So the other thing in this kind of strategy of whether to debate or not is how many debates and which debates. So the leading candidate may want to minimize or limit the number of debates, while the challenger may want to expand the number of debates. A couple of examples that I experienced on this. Uh, in 1982, when I was working on the campaign of Senator Hatch, his first re-election campaign, and he was being challenged by Ted Wilson over there, in the Institute of Politics, former mayor of, at that time actually he was the mayor of Salt Lake City. No, I guess he was the former mayor. I guess he was at the Hinkley. Anyway, uh, no, I guess he was still mayor. Sorry, I'm confusing it. You'll see why. Anyway, uh, Hatch is the leader, is the incumbent, our campaign, and this was not my idea, but our campaign manager, Mike Levitt, was we went through all the different requests for debates, and then we picked out 10 that we wanted to do. And then we just announced, here's the, the debates we're doing. It was kind of rude in a way, because we didn't even talk to the Wilson people. We just said, he'll show up. You know, he wants to come after Hatch. We'll just say, here's what we're doing. And it didn't make them a little mad, but guess what? He showed up to them, right? Because... We had the upper hand. Now, uh, six years later, this is why I was confused on what job Ted had. Uh, I was working for Governor Bangader and Ted Wilson was our challenger, but he was leading in the polls. So we had the opposite strategy. We wanted to get them together to debate as much as possible. Any different audience, we didn't care who it was. And so any request that came through, if we could schedule it, we would accept it. Now that she was on the other foot, the Wilson campaign was a little bit more like, we want to be picky, we want to limit the risk of Ted making a mistake, but how do you, when you're challenging a governor and the governor is accepted, how do you refuse to go, right? So that worked out okay too. All right, debate prep. So uh, campaigns will want to prepare their candidates with answers to the most likely questions. You, do not want to send your candidate into a debate just cold, but you want to sit down and spend some time with them on really rehearsing. What are some the likely questions you're going to get? And um, including, and then maybe especially those that are going to be negative. If there's things that your opponent's been attacking him on or your, your candidate on, you'll want to make sure that he or she can respond to those attacks. You kind of know what's coming. So you want to make sure you've got the right answers. Um, with negative uh, questions, 
Usual tactic is to pivot. We saw Hillary do that. There was a question that was kind of negative to her, where she was able to pivot it to a very legitimate subject of WikiLeaks and Russian involvement, where it started as a question about open borders and immigration. So uh, she did that well. She got the subject changed. Um, in debate prep, campaign research is used quite a bit, both issues and opposition. So where you would use opposition research is a couple ways. And I know we haven't really gone into opposition research yet, like we will in the future, but um, you would use it to know what attacks might be coming or know what the opponent is going to be saying so you can prepare your, your candidate. Of course, on issues, you want to make sure that your candidate is well informed on the major issues and has answers to the questions that are going to be, uh, that are going to be coming up. Um, if the debate is televised, you know, this is really important because your candidate is going to be exposed probably to more people than he or she will have seen during the whole campaign in 30 minutes or 60 minutes on television. So this is a huge opportunity that you want to make sure you maximize. So I guess the conclusion here is the debates can matter. We've seen that through history. Uh, you need to be prepared for them and take them very seriously. Any questions on debate strategy or what we've talked about here today? We're going to kind of, I'm going to pivot slightly, and move on a little bit to some other things. Anything from Zoom? Okay. I had a quick question. Oh yeah, please. So how much of a role do you think that um, debates actually have in like a, like a real numbers sense as far as, um, getting people out to vote and actually like changing people's minds? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, who, who is that? Ryan. Oh, Ryan. Thanks, Ryan. Um, it really depends. A lot of, both candidates are pretty evenly, uh, you know, pretty even as far as their debating skills and that there's no big surprises, no big mistakes, probably does not have much impact. You know, and even in 2016, I haven't seen anything that said that those debates between Trump and Clinton really moved anybody. Now, they may have, you know, did they motivate their, their supporters to go vote? Possibly. You know, I, don't, I haven't seen anything that really quantifies that. I think the biggest thing is there were really two big things. One is a mistake can be very damaging, and we've certainly seen that through history, the things that I shared and that were on the clip from uh, CNN and Anderson Cooper and some of these presidential debates in the past uh, can make a difference in a negative way or positive for the other person. And the other is that it can help a candidate like with uh, Jack Kennedy or with Jimmy Carter against President Ford kind of help them, help solidify them like, yeah, this person could be president and, and sort of uh, make people feel more comfortable with them. Does that help, Ryan? I don't know if that's the... Yeah. Specific, yeah. yeah. Kind of depends, but it can have an impact. A lot of times it doesn't have that much of an impact, but it certainly can. Okay, any other comments or questions? I just have a quick question. Um, do you find that um, debates are more um, influential in local or national um, yeah, and who is this? Sophie. Oh, Sophie. Thanks, Sophie. Um, I think that generally it's probably more influential and national because it gets so much more coverage. Uh, where a local race, it's pretty rare, you know, even if it's like a statewide or congressional race where it's televised, uh, at least in Utah, it's pretty rare that you ever hear anything about it again once it's over. So the people watching it may have an impact, but it's not like on the presidential stage where a mistake gets amplified so much that it you know can sink their ship, basically. Um, but it can help. I know in the uh, the Bangader Wilson uh, debates in 1988 where Bangader, though the incumbent was the underdog because of some very difficult decisions he'd made as governor in raising taxes, that putting them on the stage together really helped because, well, it just really helped. That people could understand why he did what he did, 
the contrast I think was good for Norm and uh, though Ted was very capable and he's a very fine person, uh, but it, it, it helped, helped our side I think ultimately. Okay, any other questions on that? Well, we're heading into debate season. Here's the 2020 debates. And so you'll have this on Canvas and I post this, but uh, presidential and vice presidential debates coming up starting a week from tomorrow. And then of course the VP debate right here. Uh, it's the blinds are down, but very close by uh, President Circle at Kingsbury Hall. And then the two more presidential debates. So uh, I think the debates this year have a potential to be really, really important. Um, anyone want to give their opinion on that before I give mine? Sierra. Sierra. Yes, thanks, Sierra. Um, so I just had a question. So with mail-in ballots, like, going out, like, like way earlier than, like, some of these, like, later de debates, like, on the 15th and the 22nd, and obviously like there's this big push for people to turn them in immediately this year. Like, do you think that like specifically like that third debate will even like have much of an influence on like undecided voters because so many people will probably have turned in mail-in ballots by then? Or do you still think there will be many people that haven't voted? In most of these, this walk down uh, history lane that we had, it's when there was one election day on election day that lasted for a month or six weeks, you know, and some states are doing early voting right now, right? Like I think Virginia and maybe North Carolina, maybe a few other places. Um, clearly, uh, the undecided voters, um, if they if they still haven't decided, then it could have an impact. I think you're going to see with the early voters, mostly those, you know, 80, 90 percent of the voters who have already already decided. So it could still have an impact on those later deciders, the undecided, you know, that they may be watching for some uh, clue or some cue of, you know, which way should they go. But uh, I think the early voters will be, you know, people who've decided. So I think it will still have an impact, but it does change the dynamic for sure, because you could have people who vote early and then there's some big mistake in one of these later debates they can't take their vote back. I guess maybe literally they, well, I don't know. They can't take it back, I don't think. So if it's been accepted, if it was, um, you know, there were no mistakes or anything, nothing to cure, uh, they can't change their mind. It's too late by that point. Okay, any other thoughts or comments? All right, on the state level, we also have a lot of debates coming up. So I've given you the schedule for the Utah Debate Commission, which is sort of like the state counterpart to the National Commission on Presidential Debates. Uh, and so they uh, are going to do a number of these on television. Um, so it'll be interesting. There pro I'm sure there will be others and others that are not exactly debates, but maybe forums where one candidate speaks, then the, they leave and the other candidate comes in and speaks. Those aren't as fun or exciting in my opinion, but now we're gonna have our own debate in our own class, yay. On October 7th, the same day as the VP debate, so to just get us in the mood for the VP debate, we're going to host a debate between Shireen Gorbani and Laurie Stringham, candidates for the uh, Salt Lake County Council for an at-large seat. Uh, Shireen is the incumbent, but appointed incumbent, so this is really your first time on the ballot for that race. Uh, so this is gonna be on Zoom. There's an extra credit opportunity. Some of you have already seen this, but I put this, I posted this today. Let me just talk about that a little bit. So um, I've given them pretty strict rules on the debate, but I'm inviting your help. If you'd like to help suggest questions to be asked. So basically we'll have about 22 minutes and uh, this is all posted on Canvas. Maybe you've already seen this. I'll just cover it real quickly but I'm inviting you to submit one to five questions that could be asked. Now the ground rules are, the question needs to be the same question for both candidates that they each could answer. Uh, so not slanted one way or the other, but just a straight up question on an issue. For every question you submit to me that follows this rule of being something that is could be asked to both candidates, 
I'll give you 10 points, whether or not your question is used, up to a t uh, maximum of 50 points or five questions. So I'm asking you if you're interested in earning a little extra credit, send me your questions uh, in a Word document by next Sunday night at 11.59, our favorite day and time. And uh, if I decide to use one of your questions, I will ask you to offer them. Now, I know that we've got some people working on at least one of these campaigns. So in that case, uh, I'd still, you can still earn extra credit, but I would not have you ask the question. But maybe I'd ask your question. It's a good question. Todd, did you have a yeah, question? So the question will be emailed to you, or is there a place on campus? Yes. No, not on campus. Just send me in a Word document. Then I'll go through them between uh, next Sunday and sometime before the 7th, decide which ones I think would be good. If, uh, if there's one of yours that I'd like you to ask, I'll follow up with you and say, how about asking this question? If we have time, we may not have time to get to all of them. But I thought this would be a fun way to uh, involve the class, but also in a way that is, uh, I'm really very, you know, a real stickler of I want this to be totally fair to both candidates. And so, uh, and it's funny, these days, even in the presidential debates, as we saw, particularly in the exchange between Hillary and uh, Trump, um, questions are much more personalized to a particular candidate than they used to be. Uh, those were never debate rules I would agree to. I always felt like the question needed to be, you know, I, I feel like it's more fair if it's the same question posed to both candidates rather than something that like, oh, they're going to give me a zinger, then they're going to give my opponent a cream puff. And so uh, that's how we'll do it. Any questions on that? So I think that'll make it fun. We will be on Zoom, but uh, that way they don't have to wear masks either. So that's a plus even though it'd be fun to be here in person. Okay, uh, next 20 minutes, we're gonna start on the textbook, chapter two on political math. So some elections are very close, decided by relatively few votes. We know that, a couple of famous examples. Um, well, let me give you a couple of my examples first. So in 1988, I've talked about this, I'm gonna to continue to, I'm sure, the Bangladesh re-election, where he'd been trailing in the polls by like 30 vote, 30%. Eventually he won in a three-way race, 40% to 38%. About 11,000 votes out of 650,000 votes. So very close. In 1991, when I first ran for Salt Lake City Mayor, it was a five-way race in the primary. Every poll had me in third or fourth place going into primary election night. When I went to my little victory party with my supporters, I had notes in my pocket to give a concession speech because I thought clearly I've lost. I ended up squeaking through into second place by 0.003%, by 102 votes. So sometimes these races are very, very close. All right, nationally we have the famous example of Bush versus Gore in 2000, where Bush carried Florida by 537 votes, thus winning the Electoral College, although we lost the popular vote. And then similarly, our last presidential election in 2016, Trump won with a little bigger margin in the Electoral College, 304 votes, but lost the popular vote, 46.1 to 48.2, uh, or 63 million votes to 66 million votes. So Trump uh, won in three, three states that were key, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan, which really won him the election. Uh, those are states that could have gone either way. In those three states, the total margin of victory was 79,316 votes, or 0.057% of all votes cast. So incredibly, incredibly close. Now there's been other examples that are mentioned in the textbook, such as Senate elections in Nevada, Delaware, Indiana, Missouri, Alabama, uh, even control of the Virginia State Assembly after a tie vote and picking a name of a winner out of a hat. So sometimes elections are incredibly close. Virtually every campaign manager has been on both sides of this. 
both the losing and winning side of some narrow elections. This convinces them, this is according to the authors of our book, that campaigns can totally make a difference in whether they're won or lost because there's so many elections that are very, very close and that just, <coughs> excuse me, just one minor change here or there could have made a difference in the outcome. Now, this contrasts with a number of political science scholars who um, actually, they, the notion that elections are primarily determined, their notion is that elections are determined more by structural underlying economic, demographic, and partisan fundamentals. So determined more by fundamentals of like the electorate than by whatever the campaign does or doesn't do. So here's a few examples of that. Uh, Colin and Brookman, they said they found no evidence that persuasive contact activates the candidate supporters to turn out. Now I looked at their article, this is not quoted in the text, but I share it with you. They say we present unique evidence indicating campaign persuasion is extremely rare in general elections. When party cues are absent in ballot measures and primaries or when persuasion is conducted for an advance of a general election, it appears that campaign contact and advertising can influence voters' choices. So what they concluded is in a general election, they don't believe that campaigns make much difference. But in before the general election, in a primary or in an election where candidates are unknown or like a ballot measure, it could definitely have an impact. Um, all right, well, what do you think about that? Let me go back. If that's true, why are we here? Right? That's what I think about it. <laughs> if campaigns make no difference, we should cancel this class, call it good. But obviously we think they can matter, and that's why we're here. Any any comments or thoughts on that? Does that surprise anybody? I think it's a little, I thought it was a little surprising. Okay. Well, so there is this scholarly skepticism, but the campaign managers who were surveyed for this book um, do not suggest that campaign effects are large and none seem to believe that there are big pools of moderate undecided voters, but they agreed that the, and they agreed that fundamentals greatly matter, but they also leave ample room for marginal effects of turnout or persuasion. So again, this is really what we're focused on is not that there's 50%, not in a, in a general election, usually, 50% of the voters who could go either way, there's usually 5% or 10% or something like that that could go either way that the campaign is really focused on, as well as not losing the support they already have. So here's some questions to consider. Are those who say fundamentals matter most and campaigns hardly register on the results correct? Are those that say mobilization is most vital correct? What about issues about what about those who say persuasion is the most important factor? Do campaigns matter? And if they matter, do they matter by mobilizing their sides, partisan voters, or by persuading swing voters? So what do you any thoughts on these questions? Will I get a drink of water? I have a I have an opinion on this. Yeah, and give us your name, please. Uh, it's Ryan. Oh, hi, Ryan. Um, so I, 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 this is just my thinking. Again, I have not done a study, um, but I feel like I feel like a bad campaign can hurt more than a good campaign than help can help, and I feel like part of campaign strategy is just avoiding the really bad things because a bad campaign can definitely derail a candidate, but I don't know if a good campaign can really win in a place where they otherwise would be unable to. That's interesting. Okay. I, I could see that. I could see that. I think it could be both, but yeah, I, I think it's an interesting point you made. Thanks for sharing that. Other thoughts or comments? On this controversy of do campaigns matter or not? Charlie, please. Hi. Uh, I actually disagree with that, uh, that point. I, I actually think that a good campaign can make a huge difference. Um, 
I mean, you can look at uh, race, uh, races historically, and there's some races that have been in very red or very blue areas throughout the entire country that with a good campaign, campaign manager, or a good candidate could actually sway the sway that seat. Um, incumbents being um, removed, and and sometimes even in the same party. I mean, uh, I'm trying to think, there was one in New York that was a, a really long time incumbent lost to somebody, or was it was it New York or was it New Jersey? I don't remember exactly. Um, I think it was a Democrat or was it a Republican? I, I don't remember. There was there's been a lot of examples of races where campaigns have really made a huge difference in the positive, and so I actually would very much disagree with that point. Yeah. Okay. I think you could both be right. I'm not just trying to be political here, but I think that uh, a, a, a good campaign can make a difference. I also think a bad campaign can make a difference. And there's probably other campaigns where they really don't make much difference. That the fundamentals are so strong, there's really no way to overcome them. So I think it's, it's kind of all over the place. All right, so the point I'm, I wanna get across here from the book is that um, Many political scientists do argue that the fundamentals, such as the economy, the incumbent's approval ratings, the partisan composition of the district or of the electorate, ultimately sort winners and losers, not hundreds of decisions that campaign managers and candidates make. We've kind of talked about this, so unless anybody has something really that they really want to say, I think they have a point, but I don't think you can uh, say it makes no difference. Okay, anyone disagree with that? All right, so, and give you a number of examples. I don't think I'll take the time because we're to go through each of these, but you can just see these examples of where the scholars have raised concerns or raised at least skepticism that uh, campaigns make as much difference as, as people um, in the campaign business might assume. Okay, I thought I saw a yeah. hand. So this kind of scholarly doubt is rooted in several assumptions. Um, all of these fundamentals that could make a big difference and that no amount of campaign spending or brilliant strategy can change those, uh, those fundamentals. And uh, also that scholars argue that even if campaigns had the potential to change entrenched minds, there would need to be measurable differences in the impact of competing advertising campaigns. So what they're saying here is that, yeah, campaigns, okay, but they, they kind of negate each other. You know, one person runs an ad, another person runs an ad. A lot of times the spending is fairly even, at least maybe even enough of what makes a difference that, you know, they're, they're just skeptical that this really makes that much of a difference. Well, campaign managers point out that much of the scholarly research is focused on presidential campaigns where fundamentals are likely to matter the most and campaigns are likely to matter the least. So what they're saying, it may be more true for presidential campaigns than most of the campaigns in America. Um, because we know that there's thousands of non-presidential campaigns and elections, whether for Congress, legislature, governor, city and county elected officials, and so forth. Uh, one campaign manager stated, Maybe the notion that campaigns have little effect has some validity on the presidential level, but on the state and local levels, I think campaigns make all the difference. So down ballot races, as they're sometimes called, are more susceptible to campaigns effects than high profile races because the quality of the campaigns vary more widely at the local level. So things are not always as even a playing field as you get down the ballot into these uh, smaller races. Um, so there's a couple of arguments that talk about that, you know, that basically as you go down the ballot, it's less true, but, you know, presidential, it may be somewhat true. So let's just throw it out. What, what do you think about this idea of the scholarly skepticism versus the counter arguments that no campaigns can make a difference? If you had to make a choice, which, which side would you be on or somewhere in the middle? Yes. I agree with the yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and maybe where it's less partisan too, right? It could have a bigger impact. Okay. 
Thanks. Anna, right? No. What's your name? Abby. Abby. I had the first letter right. Okay. Abby. Thanks. Uh, yeah, other thoughts on this? I guess my main point would be uh, we are here for a reason. Campaigns can make a difference, but it's also good to sort of temper that because one thing that is also, I think, very true is that those who are campaign consultants, maybe professional campaign managers, they may overstate what the good they can do for a candidate, right? They may oversell. Like we could take anybody and make them president, you know, we can, well, there's a lot of other factors and certainly the fundamentals, the partisan uh, nature of the electorate, where, where they line up on a partisan basis, what's going on in the economy. You know, there's just a lot of other things going on that, can't, that also matter, but certainly on the margin and many, dis, many elections are decided on the margin. Many elections are won by less than 10% or even less than 5% of the vote. And that's where campaigns really can make a difference. Okay, thanks everybody. We'll see you one way or the other on Wednesday. Get ready for all these debates coming up. Oh my goodness, it's like my favorite time of the decade. Thanks for listening. Please rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at podcasts at c-span.org. Thank you.